This episode of Let's Argue About Plants is brought to you by Bluestone Perennials, a second-generation, nationally renowned mail order nursery. Bluestone offers over 1,400 varieties of perennials, grasses, ground covers, and shrubs for shipment throughout the U.S. All plants are grown in natural fiber, biodegradable pots that plant directly into the soil, and all plants are 100% guaranteed. Visit bluestoneperennials.com today. Welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who just simply love plants. But not always the same ones. I'm Carol Collins. I'm Associate Editor at Fine Gardening Magazine. Hi, Carol. I'm Danielle. I'm the Executive Editor here at Fine Gardening Magazine. And today's topic is really getting me revved up for spring because spring has finally hit. I, I mean, I feel like I'm putting the cart before the horse here, but we, uh, we've reached the 60s, not consistently, but here in New England, right, Carol? Yeah. <laughs> and then not snow the next day, but you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's horse. true. <laughs> I'm keeping my eye on the prize. 60, so it's spring, and that gets me excited about nursery trips and trips to the garden center. And, you know, I've said it. I've got mainly shrubs in my garden, but I definitely need to up my perennial game this year. I I noticed holes last year, and I noticed holes in really difficult spots. So today we're going to be talking about problem-solving perennials. Pere- you know, give me a definition of what you went into thinking about this topic, Carol. I was looking at uh, anything that can grow in my horrible conditions, and... <laughs> Oh, I think all of these plants are ones I grow or have grown. Um, but yeah, I've got some problem spots. So <laughs> you got some problems, di- Carol, and all different problems too. So that's, that's oh, where, oh, that's, that's good. How I, that's how I kind of came at it. Oh, that's good. That's good. So you have a lot of different conditional issues going on in in your garden. Okay, because yeah. mine are pretty much. You know, I, I'm I'm just going to warn everybody. Here's, you know, spoiler alert. Mine are primarily, maybe except for one, my hell strip, you know, where it's hot, baking, sun, lean soil, that sort of thing. So I'm liking that you've got some more conditions going on. So, so kick us off with your first plant and your first problem that you had to solve. Okay. So my first problem is a lack of late season nectar plants. For pollinators, oh. sort of after the midsummer bonanza, I, I realized that I had a ton sort of in July and August, and then after that, it dried up. So I had put in a lot of asters and things like that, um, and I was looking for something different. And I was at Broken Arrow Nursery, and I found Yakushima bush clover, which is Lespedeza bicolor, Yakushima. It's hardy from zones five to eight. And... I've always wanted a Lespedeza, but most of them are huge, right? Just like these monstrous things. And actually, this one is uh, technically considered a subshrub in the southern part of where it can grow. But for us, it acts like a perennial. It dies to the ground pretty much every winter, but it comes right back from that base. Nice. Um, So this, this one stays, it's a dwarf. It stays 12 inches tall up to 30 inches wide. So if you're looking for a pollinator feeder for the late season and you have a small place to put it, this is a good one. I'm in shock right now. You know, for anybody who's not watching our YouTube video, like my jaw just dropped open because you're right. Lespedes is like, I thought, oh, okay, on the small side, this thing's going to be like three by three, four by four. Maybe. (laughs) That's so tiny. Well, like cute, tiny, not insignificant. And um, so it it flowers pretty late in the season. I think it started maybe August and then, you know, goes through September. Um, But it looks great early in the season. The foliage is like these these little compound trifolate leaves and they are just adorable. Tons and tons of them. It's like green confetti on this little mounding, you know, it looks like a teeny little shrub. And, um, it's, it, it has a, it has a problem. And so (laughs) (laughs) you 
it was almost like I didn't want to get into this, but I have to. Okay. Okay. So, all right. You this, were hesitant. All right. I am. But uh, this was introduced to fr from Asia. This is an Asian species, and it was introduced in the United States in like the late 1800s. So it's been here a long time. And in the 20th century, people got this brilliant idea that it would be great for erosion control and habitat restoration. It's not a native plant, but, you know, they were kind of working with the information they had back then. And in the South, in, in states in the South and even the Mid-Atlantic, it has escaped into the wild. And so you, you have to be careful, especially in the Southern part of the range. Um, but if you're not planting masses of it next to a wild area, I think it's going to be okay. And certainly for those of us up here in the north where it's not going to escape and, you know, fill ravines, um, I think it's a great plant. But it's one of those ones, it's like they thought it was a problem solver for a problem that it it really wasn't good for. <laughs> that is so, like, such an awesome plan. I'm adding that to my list immediately because I love Laspidiza as is, those little, like, clovery type leaves. Um, but thank you for the warning for, you know, it has escaped in some areas. I feel like that was, like, one of the, like, the donkey tail spurge I talked about. If you're in California, don't don't plant it, you know, in our past episodes, but, um, cool plant, very cool plant. All right. So I'm, I'm going for, I, um, I have an area <laughs> that is along our driveway. It's a parking area. It's an elevated at the bottom of a slope against a retaining wall in full sun all day long. <clears throat> it has terrible lean soil it's the area where, you know, as much as you amend, 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 it just kind of, it's such well-drained soil that it just leaches right out again. Um, and so, you know, yeah, there's the standards there. You know, I've got some sedums, I've got some catmints, um, and they've done okay, you know, nothing great. But, you know, I kind of wanted something different. So several years ago, I picked up Northern Dragonhead which is Draca, <laughs> Dracocephalum ruchiana, and it's zones three to seven. And quite frankly, I had never heard of this plant before, ever. Never seen it, never heard of it, didn't know it existed. Um, and once I found it, I thought, oh, this is cool. And I almost got nervous planting it in this area because I didn't want it to die because it was so cool. I thought it was going to need a lot of TLC in order to get through and be like one of those choice perennials. But I gave it a whirl because you know what? Strictly based on the fact that it looks like creeping rosemary, like a prostrate rosemary, that's exactly what its foliage and its habit is, is like. Um, you're going to get something that's, you know, about eight, maybe 10 inches tall, and then 12 to 18 inches wide, needly green foliage. The foliage is a little pungent, but doesn't smell like a rosemary. You know, it has more of like a, a distinct, maybe uh, minty fragrance to it. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, it gets in midsummer these beautiful true blue snapdragon like flowers to it. And they're fragrant to boot, you know, as if it couldn't like have any more cool things going on. And, you know, it has held up so, so well in this area. I planted my first ones. I believe probably three years ago and they have massed out to full size. They're about a, a foot wide now. And it's just this billowy ground cover that is not the norm. You know, it's not a catman. It's not a sedum, a low growing sedum. And it's texture is so cool. It's flowers are beautiful and it's holding its own in this lean soil, in this hot baking sun area. It's just, it's kind of my, it's kind of my jam right now. So I went back, I got a couple more of them. I ended up seeing them a little more frequently in uh, one of our specialty nurseries in my area and, and picked up a couple more last year and they're, they're doing well. They're doing well so far. So surprising. And that's Northern Dragonhead. Have you ever heard of this plant? I 
was the first one from our plant sale? I believe it was. I believe oh. it was. And it looks like nothing in the pot, right? It looked like a like couple of sprigs of rosemary, basically. Yeah. I think the reason that was added to the list was that someone wanted to write a, um, a we did our plant description and they <laughs> wanted to do a Game of Thrones joke or something in the plant <laughs> description. But it seems like strange luck that it came to you. It, it's it's that is such strange luck and like yeah i totally get the great game of thrones because northern dragon head i mean that's such a great name for it yeah totally love this plant great in hot baking sun great in lean soil all right carol what is your next problem that you had to solve okay this is this is a problem that i think is like you know nationwide it's disappearing monarch habitat Aww. and yeah and we can all feel bad about it. We all would, would like to do something about it, but not everyone can grow um, straight up milkweed like the Asclepias seriaca. It is too big for most gardens. It runs. I had a friend, I was offering her milkweed plants. She's like, I will not plant anything called milkweed. <laughs> for her, <laughs> for her, I have uh, butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa. It is a sweet little polite sized milkweed. It will not spread by uh, rhizomes. It has tuberous roots and that's how it got its name, tuberosa. Um, hardy from zones three to nine. It is pretty much uh, native to the entire lower 48 states. I'm sure there are some states where it isn't, but if you look at its map, it is just all over the place. Um, I think West Coast and North Pacific Northwest, not so much, but huge range, um, easy to grow in dry, well-drained soil, full sun. Those are really its only requirements. The soil can be garbage. I have <laughs> grown it in my garbage soil and it's, you know, it is totally fine. Um, it does make seeds. It makes those adorable little parachute seeds, but it is not a really big self-sower. So you don't have to worry about it taking over. But what I love about it is it stays really small, one to two feet tall and wide. And so you can tuck this into multiple beds on your, you know, around the garden. And it, it when the monarchs come looking for host plant for their caterpillars, they're going to they're going to find plenty of real estate. Um, I like to grow this with a couple other kinds of milkweed that aren't too pushy. Uh, I like swamp milkweed, for example, which is Asclepius incarnata. Um, but this has such a unique color. I love those tangerine colored flowers and not just butterflies, but all kinds of other pollinators love it too. So it's it's got a lot of value, not just as monarch habitat, but also for pollinators in general. Nice. Carol, when does, when does the tuberoso bloom? Did you say that? I'm sorry. I missed I, it if you did. No, I didn't say, but it, it is a long blooming plant. It reblooms. And so I usually get the first flowers in maybe June or July. Oh, wow. And then it carries through. Generally, I'll have flowers going not all the way to the end of the season because it really wants to start making the seed pods in September or October, but <laughs> flowers pretty much right up until then. Wow, that's awesome. And uh, one other thing I didn't know I found this out in my research is it's not just a host plant for the monarch butterfly, but also for the gray hair streak and queen butterfly. Ooh. Yeah. Now I'm going to have to Google that. I want to know what a gray hair streak butterfly looks like. That's cool. That's awesome. And I, yeah, as a testament to how, you know, how crappy a soil this plant can grow in. I feel like the most beautiful ones I've ever seen were growing along the highway out when I was in Illinois. It was literally like I was going down, I think, I think that's 94 out there and looking and there were stands of it basically along the highway in that crappy, you know, construction soil basically. Um, and just beautiful, you know, fired up with that orange, beautiful flowers. Um, I was going too fast to notice if there were any monarch butterflies on. Though, so, yeah, I like that. That's it. That's it. That's a winter plant for sure. For sure. All right. So um, my problem that I was looking for a solution for from a perennial was um, I have primarily sun 
for my gardens. Um, but I do live in the woods. So I have these areas that, you know, kind of transition from full sun into partial shade. And then once you get to a wood, you know, the wooded edge, it becomes pretty dense shade, you know, very small area. But uh, I was looking for a plant that would be that provide continuity, you know, provide cohesion, a plant that could take full sun to full shade. And that's not easy to find. Um, You know, most of the time, if they say full sun to full shade, in one of the conditions, the plant looks like crap, you know, it burns out in the sun or in the shade, it looks weak and measly. But one plant that I found through trial and error and sheer luck that does well in that condition is Biacovo geranium. Um, And that's geranium cantabrigiense Biacovo, and that's zones four to eight. Um, So this is a ground cover, I will call it, geranium. It actually gets to be about 10 to 12 inches tall and masses out into about 18 inches. But don't think of this as like Roseanne geranium. You know, this isn't one of those sprawler crawlers kind of with this unruly-ish habit. This is a really well-behaved perennial geranium. It makes this lovely kind of rhizomatic mat of foliage. And the foliage to me reminds me of teeny tiny little lily pads. They're really adorable, kind of this just this lovely leaf. To it, So they're slightly glossy as well, which is a little bit different for a lot of the perennial geraniums. The Biacovo has a, a glossy leaf to it. And then, you know, a, I guess it's probably for me late May, early June. So we're talking, you know, late spring, maybe early summer. All of a sudden, these teeny tiny little wiry stems in a mass, you know, we're talking dozens and dozens, rise above the foliage just a couple of inches and support these really lovely little star shaped pinkish white flowers. Um, They're really beautiful. If you get up close to them, they have a little red anther in the middle. Um, Just dainty, really just a real girly plant. I hate to say that, but that's what it looks like. You know, little ballerina tutus, that sort of thing. Um, And this thing puts on that, that big show of, of flowers in late spring, but then it keeps blooming sporadically all throughout the summer. Um, it's not that huge flush that you get in spring that lasts several weeks, but you know, a dozen flowers here, a dozen flowers there. I mean, it keeps putting on a show and that's awesome. And in sun and shade, you know, I've got one that is literally planted next to a pathway, a stone pathway with radiant heat, full sun all day long, southern exposure. And then I've got one that literally lives happily at the base of a leather leaf viburnum on a woodland edge. And they both look awesome and everywhere in between. So I've spotted this plant kind of throughout my whole bed. And the reason I've done that is because this thing is so easy to divide. You can literally go in in spring and rip out a clump with your fingers and throw it in the ground and it takes off, Um, but not unruly, not unruly. It's just really easy to transplant. Um, And one thing that I did want to mention about the Biocovo geranium on top of, you know, being able to be in all sorts of conditions is that it gets awesome fall color like great fall color. I actually remembered to take a picture of it this fall. So I'll throw a picture of it up on our uh, show notes at finegardening.com in the podcast. It's red. It's, It's like a maple tree. It's like a sugar maple on the ground, only 10 inches tall. It's this beautiful fall foliage. And I just... I love this plant. There's there's nothing wrong with it. I, I hate to say that because it'll probably all die this year, but there's nothing wrong with this plant. Um, and zones four to eight. So that's a pretty large range too. Carol, I'm loving that your problem solving plants are, you know, you're looking for pollinators, you're looking for, you know, monarch habitat. And mine have been all conditional at this point too, you know, bad soil, bad exposure. So what is your your next problem that you keyed into? Um, so my next problem is a real problem I have. I have partial shade and heavy, heavy deer pressure. Um... The deer are in my yard daily. And that is year round. And I cannot grow hostas. Everyone Mm -hmm. loves hostas for these conditions I have. And I just, I, I think the previous people grew hostas. There are some that try to come up every year and the 
deer eat them to the ground, they disappear for another year. <laughs> um, so I just, I, I need something interesting for shade that the deer will leave alone. And I found October moon Japanese shrub mint. And I think Steve might have covered this in a early episode of the podcast. Um, for me, I discovered it again through the, that plant sale we used to do. I got one and they it's a good plant to just have one of. It gets three feet tall, 18 to 24 inches wide. It, it looks like a shrub. It is not a yeah. shrub. It dies to the ground every year. And it has this fantastic foliage, uh, ser- oval leaves, big oval leaves, maybe three inches, four inches, uh, serrated edge, and then um, a variegation of apple green and a nice medium, you know, juicy medium green. Um, and it's a mint relative, so you can kind of picture it a, a little bit, but it does not have any of the bad habits that mint has. Okay. It, it stays put. It does not spread by rhizomes. It just... What I've noticed is the clump just gets a little bigger and beefier every year with more stems, mm-hmm. um, but it, it never gets taller than that three feet tall. Uh, I don't know if I said the hardiness zones, but it zones five to eight. And the uh, the botanical name, Leucoceptrum step, stellipylum, I think, stellipylum, October moon. Um I, I am looking to see what else I have in the note. Oh, okay. So I want to talk about the flowers. They are very, very late. And it's got like minty sort of looking flowers, like those little <laughs> compound flowers that, yeah, yeah, pink, white. They arrive in October here in Connecticut, usually just before the last frost. And it is just like, you know, my little October miracle when it blooms before it gets hit by frost. But I have heard people in the South report that this is a really great late season uh, pollinator plant for them because the pollinators actually are still around when this is blooming for us. The show is pretty much over and it's just a little, you know, a little fun amusement at the end of its season. Um, But I've I've got it in a rain garden. It, It does like moisture if it can get it but it's pretty adaptable and i don't i don't give it any extra water but when it rains it gets a little extra and um it it apparently can take full sun but i have it in nearly full shade and it does just great and it does still flower so i think it's pretty adaptable in terms of light too nice nice that's it i mean that's a huge perennial that's a big perennial you know you would look at that in season and say wow that's a shrub isn't it but and it's cool that it flowers late because everybody's always looking for something that happens in October at that point so that's really cool yeah leucoceptrum I remember that from the plant sale um and I think that there's there's several other varieties now too there's one that is a clear variegated version it might even be variegata that's white instead of the the yellowish green onto medium green i think it's white on medium green like the the cultivar name escapes me now but that i feel like that might be a really cool plant for me to try out in these partial shaded areas that i have too um especially for late season interest right we're always yeah. looking for that yeah well so my next problem is is pretty straightforward voles i mean i got them but i got a lot of them <laughs> And, you know, I have boom and bust seasons of, of voles. Um, the bust seasons, are, <laughs> I still have them. They're still there. They're still causing damage in my garden. Um, I've, you know, done everything possible that's, you know, within an ecologically friendly sense to try and get rid of them and to try and stave them away from plants that I really care about and planted in cages and, and the whole nine. Um, but I have what's called, I call it the Vole Super Highway. Um, it's an area of my garden. It's four, it's about 40 feet long. It's a long, skinny garden that runs right kind of along our driveway, but it goes from a 
basically the woods, the undeveloped area, which is probably where they all hide out and have their big old campfire. And then all the way to my foundation. So this is a really long strip and I'm, you know, I'm over trying to protect plants in that area because regardless, you know, just like Bugs Bunny, you see stuff just like kind of disappear through holes and you go out there, something's wilting, you pull it out, it's got zero root system. Um, so I got to I got to start with vole proof plants or, you know, vole resistant plants. I have a lot of euphorbias in that area now. I have a lot of creeping thymes, um, ground cover thymes, but I was looking for something with a little more oomph. And I settled on, let me start trying these summer alliums. Now, these aren't bulbous alliums. You know, they actually are little bulbets, but they grow in a more rhizomatic fashion. And the foliage stays put all year long. These aren't, you know, like globe master allium that you buy the bulb and you plant it in the fall and you get the, you know, giant flower the next spring. This is different. These look more like your typical garden chives, I guess but not seedy and weedy like a garden chive. So in the variety I settled on because I liked the blue green foliage to it was serendipity allium. So that's allium serendipity. It's zones four to eight. So it's got a wide range, um, full sun, dry conditions, uh, doesn't really want for much does not seed around and cause issues. The seeds um, are reported to be basically sterile. Um, There's like was one report that I saw it from, um, I think it was Missouri Botanic Garden that over the course of five years, they found one tiny little seedling and that was it. So, you know, you don't need to worry about this becoming a problem plant. Um, But in an area where very few plants survive because the voles go after them, they tend to stay away from this allium. Um, And I guess that makes sense. It's in the onion family. We know that, you know, there will be some nibbling on, you know, uh, culinary onions that we plant. Uh, A lot of times voles might take a little nibble out of those, but they stay away from this. And as a bonus, the rabbits also stay away from it. The deer also stay away from it. Apparently, the wild kingdom are not fans of onions. So they kind of stay away from all that area. Um, 15 to 20 inches tall and about 10 to 15 inches wide, just a very polite clump, blue, green, strappy foliage. And then midsummer, early to midsummer, you get these stems of like two inch purplish flowers, more globe-like than a chive. um, And just really, really beautiful. They persist for, you know, a month maybe because they're sporadic after they do their first flush of bloom. And um, I let the seed pods stand. Pollinators go bananas when they're in bloom. They just love it. You know, it's constantly moving around the plant because there's so many bees on it. Um, And then I let the, I actually do let it go to seed because it doesn't, it doesn't propagate itself. So those seed heads are really interesting and beautiful in the winter too. So if you're looking like for a deer proof, rabbit proof, vole, resistant, I'll say, plant, try a serendipity allium. Now, Carol, you have had issues with, is it voles eating your alliums? Yes. The yeah, okay. cul- culinary onions, they, they seem to love. Um, they, but no. I have, I have millennium allium mm-hmm. and that one they seem to leave alone. So yeah. It, so it, they're discerning somewhat. I guess voles don't like summer alliums. <laughs> I think they have the same taste as we wouldn't eat the summer alliums. So they, they we aren't eating them either. True, <laughs> true, true. <laughs> All right, dear listeners, we are coming to the end of our plant picks. Carol, what problem do you have? I feel like a shrink today. <laughs> Carol, tell me about your problems. Oh, I've got problems. So <laughs> this last problem is when you need something tall, but it can't be a tree or shrub. So we have frontage on two streets uh, at our property corner. And one of the streets is a long and winding hill and we are right at the bottom. And occasionally inebriated and or inexperienced drivers end up (laughs) in my garden. Um, 
<laughs> and they will turf it trying to get back out again, right? So oh my I, gosh. I cannot, I cannot afford to put trees and shrubs in there because they will periodically be destroyed. But, you know, so that's what I need perennials. But again, because it's right next to the road, I would like to have something tall. What I found is lemon queen sunflower and mm. it's a perennial sunflower. So this, this, I think originally came from the fine gardening test garden. And I took a little chunk, you know, maybe five years ago, we, I think a bunch of us got some of this Yeah, and it is fantastic. It, it, it's a very vigorous grower. So from that little chunk, immediately it got a big plant that first summer. And I've been dividing it ever since and moving it into these problem spots. Um, but it provides great screening. It, it gets six to eight feet tall and four to six feet wide. And it doesn't, it, it spreads rhizomatously, but not aggressively. So it, it, it'll just increase year after year. And you can just lop off a chunk of it and it, it's perfectly happy both pieces will will bounce right back um, i have terrible sandy soil out there by the road and it it loves it um, this is this is an interesting uh it, it is a naturally occurring hybrid of two native North American species so you've got stiff sunflower which is helianthus possiflorus subspecies subromboideus 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 right. somebody said it has rhomboid shaped leaves i'm like okay okay I, <laughs> maybe maybe not i don't know about rhomboid shaped leaves but um and then the other parent is helianthus tuberosus which a lot of us know mm -hmm. as jerusalem artichoke yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. So cool. um, now I can see like now I can see the similarity between those two. Yeah. Yes. And so it has those gorgeous uh, golden daisies with a little darker golden center on these super long stems. Um, people describe the foliage as coarse, but I think it looks nice. It's fine. It's sunflower foliage, uh, lance shaped, jagged edge, plenty of it. Um I find that if there's too much shade, I get a little powdery mildew on it. But most of the plants, especially the ones in full sun and really lean soil, they're they're fine. So you have to be a little careful. It really does need full sun, I think. Um, blooms from July to September, really long bloom time. And I don't think, unlike Jerusalem sunflower and probably stiff sunflower or Jerusalem artichoke and stiff sunflower, I don't think it makes a ton of seeds, but it makes enough that the goldfinches hang around. Um, the thing I really like is that the bumblebees is in the late season, they are, they are on it all the time. And even on a very windy day, they'll be clinging to those flowers like it's bucking broncos and they will not let go. They're like, I'm fine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome oh it's it's a fun plant i just i it's just so cheerful and it, for me with the style of gardening that i have it fits with everything so i i love it and it has solved some multiple problems around the edges of my property so talk to me about flopping does I, it flop it will if your soil is too rich so okay yeah for my crappy soil, it, it no problems. But I think if you if you use a lot of mulch, if your water, if your soil is naturally moist, or if you get a lot of rain, you may have problems. You may need to stake it. I I do not in any of the places I have it. But yeah, that is something to be careful. Of. Okay, um, but no, good general, to know. Good to know. A a vase shaped habit that for me is it is solid. Nice, 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 nice. I like it. I like it a lot. I I do. I'm trying to think that if I got that or Rudabacchia maxim, I'm I'm not sure what I, you know, it's been a long winter. I can't remember what I have. I have one or the other. I either have the Helianthus or the, or the Rudabacchia maxima. I can't remember, but one of them was from the test garden and it looks great. So yeah, I like that. It's also the um the bucking bronco to the bumblebees as well. <laughs> it's the best. All right. My last problem is uh, I have a lot of deciduous trees, uh, small trees, small, you know, 
under 20 feet scattered throughout my landscape. And um, so, you know, planting around, under planting around trees is difficult as is, you know, it's, it's an area that's dry shade. Um, trees are thirsty, especially if they have a lot of surface roots, which a lot of trees, ornamental trees do. So it steals moisture. So, you know, it would be easy if it was just dry shade and that's all you needed to look for, you know, like let's plant some epimediums or something along those lines. But, um, if it's a deciduous tree, especially in, you know, Northern locations in spring, that's a full sun area for a lot of people. And so what's a plant that you can take full direct sun for the spring months, but then not die and croak out when it receives, when the, when the trees leaf out and it's dense, dry shade. Um, this was a complete happenstance for me. Um, I had a Cirrus canadensis. It's a large one now. It didn't start out that way, but in the front garden, it's about 20 feet tall and it's that situation. So I needed something for underneath and we got a free sample plant. I love a sample plant. And it was spot on lungwort, which is pulmonaria spot on. It's zones three to nine. I think most people are probably familiar with lung warts. I've had a love-hate relationship with them over the years. I've had some issues with them rotting, um, winter hardiness, powdery mildew. Um, I've had a lot of issues with lung warts over the years, but uh, word on the street is there's been a lot of breeding done with lung warts to try and get away from a lot of those issues, the rotting issues, the fungus issues that that they've had in the past. And I can't speak highly enough about this spot on cultivar. It, I basically threw it underneath that large red bud tree. And for the last couple of years, it's done really well. Now, It kind of makes sense, right? So this is a early spring plant that needs that sun in the beginning of spring to really push up a small amount of its foliage. It really does not push all of its foliage all at once. It kind of stays dwarf and muted um, and a muted size in the beginning of spring, throws up these gorgeous pink that the the buds of the flowers are pink they're little tubular shaped flowers and as they open they turn to a true blue and then it's beautiful because as the flowers fade the flowers actually turn purple so you kind of get this whole you know pink purple blue thing going on constantly um the leaves at that point are lance shaped they are lung wart they look like spotted lungs so they're green and they have spots of silver on them it's really really beautiful it's not not a super silvery lungwort. It's not, you know, primarily silver. I would say it's more green with occasional spatters. And then that red bud is in bloom at the same time. So I'm getting all of that magenta pink blossoms on the red bud. And at the same time, here's this lungwort kind of giving me that same color echo. Then those giant heart-shaped leaves on the red bud leaf out dense shade underneath there with a lot of aerial roots from the red bud and the lungwort is perfectly happy because at that point the foliage has completely emerged it's become you know kind of this um, I gotta look to see ultimately it gets 18 inches wide so you know you're talking a big leafy shade plant and then it's happy as a clam for the rest of the season now I'm guessing because it's not in these super moist conditions of a, like a moist shade area. That's why I have not seen any instance of powdery mildew or anything of that sort. It also I'm sure is due to some of the breeding that they're doing with these new lung warts, but um, so far so good. So, you know, if you need a dry shade plant that, that is just gangbusters and really puts on a spring show. Um, I would go with spot on lung war. It's, it's, it was a happy accident. I will call it that. <laughs> and now because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter to talk about how he solves problems. I like to think of myself as a fairly adept problem solver. I'm level headed and that serves me well when dealing with unforeseen issues. And I've worked in publishing for nearly 40 years where each and every day presents a series of problems to solve, from convincing an author that grammatical fixes are not optional, to figuring out how to make a tiny book budget stretch. But there is one current problem, 
that I've not been able to solve. It involves my neighbour and her affinity for squirrels. She's a lovely woman, beautiful yard, no obnoxious parties until two in the morning. On face value, she's the perfect neighbour. But she likes to feed the squirrels. Cute pastime? Yes. Activity that has led to big headaches for the level-headed English gentleman who shares a property line with her? Definitely. Now, in the winter, I noticed that my neighbour was opening up her sliding door occasionally and tossing out what looked like whole walnuts. An adorable grey squirrel would climb the porch steps dutifully, grab a nut, and quickly head for the nearby hedgerow to devour it. Then I noticed that the squirrels, because now there were several that showed up daily to the all-you-can-eat buffet, were tapping on the sliding glass door often, demanding walnuts. I chuckled to myself and muttered something about asking for it and went about my business. Then the tapping started happening at my house. Apparently, word on the street is that my house, due to its close proximity to the walnut factory, is also an all-you-can-eat buffet. Just ignore them, I thought. They'll go away eventually. I, th I thought wrong. We're now deep into spring, and around three times a day, my concentration will be interrupted by an incessant tapping that goes on for several minutes. This is followed by the sounds of small feet scurrying around our deck, followed by wrestling noises with lots of loud chirps. Is it mating season? My stars, I hope not. I have no idea what to do. All of my previous problem-solving skills did not prepare me for dealing with a gang of marauding squirrels who feel like they have permission to harass me, thanks to my kind-hearted neighbour. I've read that you can buy coyote urine and spray that around your property to try and deter the squirrels. Dear Lord, I don't want it to come to that. I can go voice my frustrations at my neighbour, but what good will that do? At this point, I'm simply hoping that the furry gang will move on to another neighbourhood soon. Hmm, that gives me an idea. Maybe I should start tossing macadamia nuts into the yards of the people down the street. After all, why would my fuzzy harassers stick around for lowly walnuts when they can get premium nuts a few streets over? Brilliant! Uh, excuse me, I have a nutty plan to go execute. You know, Carol, with a delightful accent like Peter's, I'm surprised he ever has any problems. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure he must, though, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I feel like he could get away with a lot with that accent. <laughs> All right. Let's see who we have up next for our, our expert testimony and if they've got problems. Hello, fellow plant lovers. My name's Sabrina Schweier. My husband Samuel and I operate a landscape design firm grounded in ecology and permaculture, Salisbury Schweier, Inc. in Akron, Ohio. We work primarily with homeowners in our bioregion, creating eco-mindful landscapes. As a designer and a consultant, I see a lot of challenging sites. In Northeast Ohio, we get extremes. Sometimes it's hot and dry, then we get torrential downpours, cold winters, and salt trucks. Or sometimes there's challenging soils, steep forested ravines, and then there's deer. About 70% of our clients have deer pressures. So all the plants I share today are natives and all have pretty good deer resistance, at least in our area. You never can tell with deer. One question I always get, and the biggest challenge I face on our own property, what grows in dry shade? Well, white wood aster is a fantastic perennial for these conditions. White wood aster, formerly known as Aster divaricatus, is now renamed Eurybia divaricata. I especially like the cult of our Eastern star, which is slightly more mounding and compact with larger flowers. Growing one to two feet tall, it's covered in the fall with small white daisies that dance in this abundance over the delicate burgundy stems. From August until September, October even, the blooms provide a valuable nectar source for butterflies and other pollinators. White wood aster is hardy, zone three to eight, and it's native to open woodlands throughout most of the eastern United States. Not only is it a valuable plant for poor soils and dry shade, it also tolerates black walnut and salt. How to use it? Well, plant it anywhere you have shade. It's well behaved enough to include in a perennial border or woodland garden, or encourage it to seed and spread as an interweaving ground cover as a mass planting or even a cottage garden plant. But do recognize that Eastern Star, the cultivar won't come true from seed. To keep the plant more compact and reduce seeding, you can simply cut it back to six inches in the spring or cut off the spent blooms in the fall. Eurivia divaricatum, Eastern Star, white wood aster. 
Another great dry shade plant and a good companion to the wood aster is Pennsylvania sedge, Carex pennsylvanica. Native to eastern and central North America, Quebec to Arkansas, it's a fine textured grass-like plant with blades about 12 to 15 inches tall and this beautiful arching fountain shape. The habit is absolutely gorgeous in the shade garden. It's hardy, zone three to eight. It also tolerates black walnut trees and provides food and habitat for wildlife. Pennsylvania sedge creeps slowly by rhizomes, forming a soft ground cover. If you have shade where your grass won't grow, you might try using it as a low traffic lawn substitute. I use it with a matrix of ferns, heucheras, and other natives for woodland gardens and to hold slopes. And it is beautiful as an edge plant in garden borders too. Please try and get to know some of the very useful native sedges, including this one, Carex pennsylvanica, Pennsylvania sedge. Next, I'd like to speak of a few plants for those that have the opposite problem, wet soil in the sun. These plants should be fairly happy in typical gardens too. Physostesia virginiana, the obedient plant. Note, this species is not so obedient and can be an aggressive spreader. The cultivar Miss Manners is much better behaved. With stunning spires of long blooming flowers, dark green foliage, this is one of my favorite showy native perennials. Hardy zone three through nine, and it's native throughout Eastern North America, even west to Texas and North Dakota. Obedient plant is problem solving tough. It is a great plant for a number of situations. We often use it in rain gardens as it will tolerate several days of complete inundation as well as be just fine when the soils dry out. It tolerates salt and black walnuts pretty well. I especially love the white cultivar Miss Manners, which at one and a half to two feet tall is half the height, extremely showy and well-behaved. It is a clump former, unlike the species and some of the other cultivars. The snapdragon-like flowers have a really long bloom period, June to September. We use this regularly in many of our perennial plantings. Bumblebees, butterflies, hummingbirds, they all love obedient plant, while the deer in our area tend to leave it alone. I find that the upright spiky blooms contrast so beautifully with daisies and a lot of the more rounded flowers of our native perennials. Physostesia virginiana, Miss Manners, the obedient plant. This next plant you may not know, Pycnanthemum muticum, mountain mint. This one is a workhorse for those really challenging sites. It can be competitive, but it's usually not overly aggressive. It tolerates sun or shade, wet soils, dry soils, essentially anything you throw at it, it can handle. It's a mint, so remember to give it lots of room. However, it can be kept in control with a sharp spade in the spring. A long blooming zone four to eight perennial. It's native from Maine to Texas and is probably the showiest of the mountain mints. You might wanna check out some of the others as well. This one has two to three foot tall foliage that's beautiful and aromatic. The flowers may be white to a purpley pink and they bloom above silvery bracts in the summer. We use this mountain mint for many tough sites to hold slopes against erosion, for large rain gardens, bioswales, and in landscapes that have a lot of deer browse. It's fairly salt tolerant too. But its most important attribute, this is a pollinator magnet. It attracts more beneficial insects and butterflies than any perennial I have observed. Swarming with life, you must see this plant to believe it. Pycnanthemum muticum, short tooth mountain mint, is a perennial that should be better known and grown. One last plant I'd like to slip in, Hibiscus mosquitos, our native swamp mallow and it's absolutely gorgeous hybrids. This one is dramatic, three to seven feet tall with blooms the size of dinner plates. This zone five to nine shrub-like perennial is native across much of the Eastern United States. 
Cultivars come in a variety of heights and colors, so you probably can find one suitable even to your small garden. I love hibiscus summerific evening rose for its stunning dark foliage and its huge deep rose flowers that are up to eight inches across. Rose Mallow prefers full sun, good soil, and consistent moisture. It even grows at the edges of ponds, can tolerate the challenges of rain gardens, or it can simply be a bold focal point in a garden bed. In the spring, it tends to be slow to start. Usually the shoots begin emerging in late May here in Ohio. I tend to leave the stems up in the winter for winter interest and then overplant it with spring ephemerals. Blooming from July to September, the nectar and the seed support many of our pollinators and songbirds. Hibiscus moscudos, swamp mallow, and its cultivars, an absolutely eye-popping native for moist soils. Thank you so much for having me. Happy spring planting. I loved how Sabrina used so many native plants for her problem solving. I think that's, you know, that's something we should all be trying to do more of. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, I I feel a little guilty now. I don't, I think I have one native on my list and that was it. So thanks, Sabrina. We appreciate <laughs> yeah, it. Thanks, Sabrina. It makes up for the Lespedeza. 